Welcome, I'm Amy, the producer, curator and director of the videos for Pillow Shots for the Apocalypse, featuring music from Jordan Barrett. In this video, I'm going to break down the project and tell you about the brainwaves that created this microfilm slash visual album. It's three music videos, it's a tiny film, but it began as a study of techniques. And this is a feature length ramble about it all, so get some snacks and coffee because this is the brief version. What was bought specifically for this project, meaning resources for the sets and puppets and such, came to a total of four pounds. That's garden wire, masking tape, super glue and felt pens. Those four foundations are at the core of almost everything that you're about to see, barring some recycled, repurposed materials I had to begin with. The first film segment features Jordan's track Ellipsis, and this really is the spark of the whole project, because when I first heard it, it felt like those many moments of an easy serenity you can get in an apocalypse narrative. You know it's that pause before the narrative carries on. My version of the apocalypse was going to be fueled by my undying fascination with nature, and specifically where it meets with textures of decay. So I began with some sketches of an old garden, plant pots, abandoned things, blood pools, and someone trying to reach in. But for that idea, I had to get my hands on a severed arm. There are two hand props in this film. One is a grey singular hand, and the other is a full severed arm. Both are life-sized, and both are made from newspaper. It was an interesting experiment because newspaper is simultaneously rigid and malleable, Twisting strengthens it, but painting causes tears, so the reality of the design develops as you craft. Tears become cracks, rips can become cuts, and if you feel like it, you can start biting chunks out of the arm. It was these little improvisations of imperfections that created crucial visuals in the film. Speaking of imperfections, when you start out making films, Sometimes you have ideas that you aren't technically ready for yet. I originally had this tiny scenario of a zombie locked out of a garden, and I gave it a good go. Planned the makeup, filmed it, and whilst I think the idea is great, the execution wasn't there yet. So rather than put it in the film and get the hours out of it, I killed the idea. It was Jordan's music that gave a frame to my idea. The melody had these 10 second segments which I translated into shot durations. This is how the technique of pillow shot cinematography became an intentional decision. The track ends with what I have dubbed as a gasp. That experience became the inspiration for the structure. The subjects build up from the mundane to dramatic and what felt safe isn't safe anymore. I wanted to play with that pseudo safety, that limited pause. To me, that encompasses my recent love of the pillow shot. As a technique, I think pillow shots can be overlooked because they can hold no obvious narrative value, and cinema holds narrative very dear, but I think they can hold narrative value as emotional handlers because it gives you a tiny break to consider your feelings and maybe calm down after seeing something distressing. Maybe pillow shots of the apocalypse was just a succession of shots, maybe it was narrative. Cool shot it however you want. I hope it just made you feel quiet and pause. When listening to Jordan's Lane, I was fixated on the track title, to the extent that I imagined going down a path that was guided by the music, so Lane was translated literally into a narrow road. That idea smacked me in the brain at 1am and I had to throw it down before it escaped. What does it feel like to be undead? What did they think about? These questions were inspired by the works of Isaac Marion and his novel, Warm Bodies. I read Warm Bodies eight years ago, and the way it presents the undead kind of blew my mind. I'm trying not to ruin anything, but Marion gives the brain a narrative purpose beyond the obvious, and therefore advances what a zombie's role is in the genre, and it's been ingrained into my mindset for almost a decade now. Oh, and there's a film adaptation with an amazing soundtrack, which Oh, it's also continued to be an inspiration. Anyway, that's part of why the film starts with a brain lane. I was obsessed with the idea of an anatomical pathway, which I made entirely out of repurposed cardboard. It's roughly 90 centimeters long, 30 centimeters high, and it's only 14 centimeters wide. 
For the details, I use wire, masking tape, threads, wool, and there's even nail polish, but the lane I had to consider carefully. A few crumbs would ruin the only bit of standability the puppet has, so the brain ramp is made from bundled up magazine newspaper. The next steps are made from cardboard, and the garden path is a collage of painted magazine paper. All of which are surfaces that he can stick to. The final section at the, let's say, sea of unconsciousness is cut out because I wanted actual water reflections to play with, but mixing reality and the handmade can look jarring very quickly, so I exaggerated the look of reality by using shreds of iridescent wrap that I found in a balloon weight. <laughs> Like the set, the puppet building underwent a few evolutions of refinement. When I was thinking about the puppet, I was under the impression that wire was expensive, so my first draft was crafted from newspaper, wool, and determination. His stance was deliberately hunched over, and whilst that added visual interest, it ruined the possibility of him ever being able to stand on his own two feet. So I snapped one of them off. You might call it counterintuitive. I called it future Amy's problem. Future Amy's solution was some wool and a puppet rig crafted from two dead paintbrushes and an empty paint pot and masking tape. As the set evolved into more than I had ever planned, my initial puppet draft lacked identity, and even more so after the zombie was cut from part one. My main concern was the face and head shape. With the set finalised, it made redrafting the puppet easier. I was able to think, create and make alterations based on immediate evaluations of its success. But you'll be pleased to know that I kept a bag of decapitated head drafts for you to see. <laughs> head number one, this is the original newspaper head. You can see I tried with it, it got painted and everything, but it just wasn't looking right. So I cut a cross section so you can see his newspaper insides. Ooh. Head number two, mask and tape and wool. The brain's a bit too lippy shaped if you ask me, off with his head. Head number three, opposite direction, a skull shape with a moving jaw. A bit ambitious for a few centimetres of masking tape. Head number four made the final cut. It was just masking tape and a better version of head number three. I painted him green, got a great eye going, and when the second eye didn't cooperate, I gouged it out. I made him a tiny little neck out of a half centimetre of wire and tiny little neck bones out of masking tape. The problem with this puppet's design is that you can see the string that holds it up, so the wool piece had to be either obviously a marionette sort of puppet, or obviously part of the narrative, and I love the way that it turned out. <laughs> he wasn't supposed to have arms, and you can see in my first draft that he didn't have them. That's because I thought it was going to be too ambitious to make a stop motion film in the first place. Anyway, the surgery involved some wire being thread through his newspaper torso. It was a simple procedure, but I quickly realised two arms was too many limbs to animate, and I amputated the right arm for the sake of narrative suggestion. And there you go! A walking and waving zomboy. The stop motion segment was scene 5 of 6 in the original idea, and it was meant to be one continuous shot. And I was going along with this keep it simple, you've got no idea what you're doing thing, until I watched Wes Anderson's Isle of Dogs, and I was so blown away at all the detail that it inspired me to work harder and add foreground pieces and the neck stepping stones and arms, one arm really, uh, and it took forever to make, and it's months of work in two minutes of footage, and I loved it. It was a challenge that I am very eager to try again. Having a go myself gave me a whole new level of adoration for stop motion artists. The final film was the most difficult to get going. It needed to tie all the segments together. When I first listened to John's track, Sitting in the Dark, I was visualising a strobing light. To me, the tone sounds like if electric light had a noise, and that noise was being played on a theremin, it was a simple lighting experiment idea, but as films 1 and 2 evolved so much, that idea wasn't strong enough anymore. I found my finale by revisiting The Matter of Vision written by Peter Wyeth, and I'm on an early segment called The Wisdom of Vision. It's my understanding that Wyeth is arguing that vision and thus cinema is more sophisticated than it's given credit for that we comprehend much more information with our eyes than what our brain can translate into words. He then closes this segment by referring specifically to the intimate format of cinema, a bright screen in a darkened room. 
and the track's called Satan in the Dark. It baffles me that I didn't think of this sooner. <laughs> so it was clear to me then that my finale needed to be a cinema of flowers. A cinema needs an audience, but a human audience was not the way forward. It had to be nature. He had to be alone. A singular human presence set with only earthly companionship. And then the thought of flower people overwhelmed me very quickly and suddenly I had three flower people and a potted pet filling up the seats. Yeah, they just kind of happened, I'm sorry. There was not much documented progression of their creation. There was no question of their existence, they just had to be. I had a black painted box from film number two and I repurposed that as my set for my dark room. And I wanted a classic looking cinema seat row, which I crafted from a strip of cardboard and made little armrests from rolled up magazine paper. <laughs> I tweaked the idea of a conventional cinema to a garden like cinema. I created foliage and florals from things I had around, like ribbon and paper. There's a sticky note in there, wire, masking tape leaves, that's a bit of unraveled toilet roll. The cinema curtains are layers of masking tape, which I sewed tiny seams on to look like real curtains. When you don't have access to filming lights, you have to get a little resourceful. Desk lamps, maybe you've got a camping torch. I've used filing folders as light gels in the past, but it's a difficult one to do when you want something stylized on a budget and you're the only crew member there is. This project includes overhead lighting, so I wouldn't recommend anybody try this at home. <laughs> in addition to this lighting setup, I also designed the set to invite light. So there was glitter paint all over the walls, there's gold metallic paint on the set pieces and the flower people, and then fake blood is cried on as an additional indicator of light on the main character. But also, the setting itself is light in a dark room. It's cinema. <laughs> Whilst this project started out as an excuse to practice techniques, it became much more than that. Especially as the studies intertwined with each other and the creative comfort zone got thrown out the window. <laughs> I have really enjoyed exploring my first attempt at creating apocalypse stuff and animation and an adventure in editing, and now it's time for the next one. If you made it this far, thank you for watching this feature length ramble about a five minute film. Chances are I'm already working on more stuff, so I'll see you behind the scenes soon.